today, we're diving into one of the most difficult passages. Um, I joked on Facebook this morning that I've actually earned the right to get my student loans paid off just for wrestling through this um, passage this morning because it is extremely difficult. So let me read the text. We'll um, see what the text means and what, how it's applicable for us this morning. So let, read with me, Hebrews 4, 1 through 11. Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us f fear lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. For we who have believed entered that rest, as he has said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although his works were finished from the foundation of the earth. For he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, that God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this passage he said, they shall not enter my rest. Since therefore it remains for some to enter it, and those who formerly received the good news to fail, fail to enter because of disobedience. Again, he appoints a certain day, today, saying, through David, so long afterward, in the words already quoted, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on. So then, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. Let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fail by some sort of disobedience. That's complicated. I mean, there's a ton of stuff in there and trying to figure out what this means is going to take some time this morning. But the word that's consistent there is the word rest. We see that about eight times in 11 verses, the word rest. There's an old saying that we hear and sometimes we use when we're busy that there's no rest for the... Guess no? Guess not. There's no rest for the... Weary. Weary. Um, wicked is the verse in the Bible, but there's no rest for the weary. But what does that word mean? It would describe a situation in which a tired person has to do more work. Even people who are worn out never rest because there's so much to be done. Another definition is that you keep persevering and working hard no matter how tired and overworked you are. Any of you feel that? Any of you relate to that? Restless? Any of you in this room worn out, exhausted? Any of you tired out? This relates to us, right? Probably, matter of fact, I would say that this text relates more to us in 21st century Dallas than it does to first century Rome. We are a restless people. We are people that overwork ourselves, wear ourselves out, and end our days completely exhausted, wiped out. In our society, we've come up with many solutions to address our restlessness, but none of them are ever fully satisfying. However, the Bible gives us an answer for our restlessness. It's real simple. It's one word, and it's the same answer we give for all of our problems. You guys know what it is? Can you guys speak back to me today? You know what it is? Who's the answer to all our problems? Jesus. Good job. You guys are really going to put you guys back in Sunday school again. Um, but Jesus is the pro solution to all of our problems. St. Augustine, hundreds, thousands of years ago, made this comment speaking about God. He said, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless till we find our rest in you. See, when we look at our text, you've got to understand that the readers of this letter thought that they missed God's rest. Here's what the author is telling them. He says he encourages them by telling them, listen, you haven't missed the rest at all. The door is still open. The invitation is still there. But here's a warning. Don't repeat history. Because in history, people have had the opportunity to enjoy God's rest, but they missed it over and over, over and over. And he'll give us examples in our text that people reject the rest of God. And the invitation is still open. He will talk about in our text, he'll talk about today. Today is the day of rest. Today, God offers rest. And you've got to ask the question, why does the church in Hebrews feel like they miss the rest of God? It's probably the same reason many of us feel like we miss God's rest, or we feel like we're overworked or we're overburned out. Their lives feel anything but restless. 
These guys are running around like a chicken with its head cut off. They're running around trying to save their own lives. They're getting hated on by their family. They're getting hated on by the government. They're getting hated on by their former religious friends and um, people. Everyone hates them, and they're just trying to survive. So if you ask them, hey, guys, do you feel rested? They'll look at you, and they'll say, what do you mean rested? I know God offers rest, but the last thing I feel right now is rest. I'm overworked. I'm overburdened, and I'm just trying to survive day in and day out. So their experience is telling them that none of this makes sense. The kind of rest that God is offering, because they're not experiencing it, because what they thought they would experience isn't what they're getting. The experience of Jesus wasn't living up to their expectations that they had. They're restless. Do you know who they identified with? They identified with the people of Israel that were wandering in the wilderness, That's what they felt like. They felt like they were going around in circles for 40 years, never entering the promised land. That's what these people felt like. You ever feel like that in your Christian walk? Every week after communion, we talk about Jesus coming back, and one day we will see him and worship him forever. But right now, life is difficult. Right now, life is challenging. The last thing we have on our mind right now is rest because we're worn out. The guys in the wilderness generation... They've been rescued from slavery, right? God delivers them from bondage. God brings them out, does a ton of miracles, and they get all the way to the edge of the promised land. And all they have to do is walk right in. But they walk in and they see how big the people are in the land and they get afraid. And they reject God's rest and they say, I want to go back to Egypt. And God gets angry with them and makes them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. And they wander and they wander till eventually their entire generation dies. And the writer in Hebrews is going to take that story, the story of the people of Israel wandering in the wilderness, and he's going to lay it on top of our lives and the lives of these people in Hebrews, and he's going to show us there's some similarities here, but there's also some clear dangers. There's some extreme dangers of what happened here. There's some things that we need to repent of because otherwise we're going to repeat the same cycle of wandering and wandering and never enjoying the rest that God has for us. And before we jump into the text, I've got to give you a little background because I said this text is complicated. Here's why. The writer uses the word rest eight times in 11 verses. But in those eight times, there are three different definitions of rest. So it's very hard to understand which type of rest he's talking about. Let me give that to you first, and then we'll dive into the text. The first rest is physical rest. All of us know what that's like. You're wiped out. You're drained. You get home, and you get Lying on your couch or you lie on your bed, you rest, you relax. Physical rest. The writer of Hebrews talks about them entering into the promised land as a place of physical rest. Why? Because once they enter the promised land, they don't have to wander anymore. All of us know what physical rest is like. The second rest is spiritual rest. And this is the most important passage, the rest that he talks about here. This is where he spends most of his time. This is the idea of the rest that only comes from God. It's the peace that comes from a relationship with God. It's an act of rest. It's an ability to lay things down at the feet of Christ and rest in God. It's being completely at rest at who you are in Christ. We had this rest before the fall, but we lost it. We lost our identity, and now what we do is we are wandering around trying to prove ourselves to others in hopes of finding our identity again. So we wander around the earth trying to find our identity and trying to prove ourselves, to give ourselves value and worth in the eyes of others. That's why we do the things that we do. We're restless. There's never enough stuff to obtain. There's never enough things that we can do. There's never enough people that we can meet or talk to. There's never enough friends to make. There are never enough dinner parties to attend. There's never enough social gatherings to be a part of because we find our value and our identity in what we own, in who we are, and who we know. We're restless because we aren't at rest at who we are in Jesus. This is the rest that we can experience when God is at home in our hearts when he takes residence. And listen, this isn't based on your circumstances because your circumstances can be horrible. Your circumstances can be difficult, but because you know who you are in Christ, you can sleep at night because you know God loves you and will take care of you. It's not based on how you feel that day. I'm not sure if you realize this, but these actually play off one another. 
When you rest physically, what do you do? You lay down. You close your eyes. You sleep. How much work are you doing when you sleep? Zero. Zilch. None. Nothing. You're doing absolutely nothing. Bodily rest is a picture of spiritual rest, of what spiritual rest is supposed to be like. It's laying down and finding your identity in Jesus because, so you aren't running around trying to find your identity somewhere else. And so there's physical rest, there's spiritual rest, and then there's eternal rest. Eternal rest is what God promises for his believers that he will one day come and take his children home. There will be a day when the trumpet sounds and we will see Jesus. The dead in Christ shall rise and we will spend eternity with Jesus. There is eternal rest. You know, those of us who have experienced spiritual rest, we know that's not consistent, right? Because there's days we know our identity in Christ and we know we're okay, we're secure, but there are other days when it's difficult and we forget our identity and we worry and we get confused or we get anxious about life. And we go back and forth like a seesaw, some days enjoying our identity in Christ, sometimes forgetting our identity in Christ. And we go back and forth. And Jesus says, there's coming a day when there will be no more sin. There will be no more anxiety or worry. There will be a day when you will fully enjoy the rest that I have to offer you. It's not here yet. But you get tastes and glimpses of it because of who you are in Christ. But there will be a day when you get to fully experience it. Listen, all three of these rests are connected. You can't Unless you are absolutely confident of your eternal rest, unless you are absolutely confident that one day you will spend eternity with Christ, you can't enjoy spiritual rest. Because what you're going to do is you're going to constantly strive to earn something from God, to earn favor from God. And unless you are absolutely confident of your spiritual rest, you can't really enjoy physical rest. Because no matter how much sleep you get, no matter how much rest you get, you still wake up restless, anxious, worried. All of the signs of restlessness. Okay, that's introduction. That's quite a bit. I preach right there. But here's what we want to talk to you about the text. Three things. Number one, I want to show you who the enemy of rest is. What's the enemy of rest? Secondly, I want to show you um, the way to rest. And finally, I want to show you God's invitation or call to rest. The enemy of rest. I want you to look at verse 10. Verse 10 in our text. For whoever has entered God's rest has also rested from his works as God did from his. This is a spiritual rest where one rests from his work. He puts them down. The question is, what kind of work is he talking about? Surely God isn't saying that work is bad, is he? That's not what God's implying here. He isn't saying to stop working altogether. Some of you wished that's what God said, right? That once you come to Christ, you don't have to work anymore. Um, but... Listen, there was work before the fall. God commands Adam to work the garden, to take care of the garden. There was work. There will be work when we enter the new heaven and the new earth. I joked about it when we were talking about our marriage series. Guys, it isn't the women's fault that you have to work, right? Work was there before the fall happened. You can blame the woman for the hard work you have to do, but the work was always there. You were called to work. I'm joking, by the way. Don't blame anyone else. Um, is there something wrong at working hard in life? Is there something wrong at working hard at your job? Is there something wrong at working hard in your marriage? Is there something wrong at working hard to provide for your family and for your future security? No, not at all. But listen, it can be. It can be. See, there's a way that we do our work that creates restlessness, and there's a way that we do our work that creates restfulness. It all depends on what you believe about the gospel and on what you believe about Jesus. See, it's restless when our work is self-justifying. That's a key word for you to remember this morning. It's restless when our work is self-justifying. That's what most of us, our work is. Let me explain that. It begins as a child. We work hard to justify ourselves by trying to please our parents and avoid trouble. So we do everything possible to make them happy. Then we try to justify ourselves by trying to look cool before our friends. Then we try to justify ourselves by guys, you trying to look smooth for your women, and girls, you trying to look good for your, uh, for your men. 
Then we try to justify ourselves by getting good grades. We justify ourselves by trying to get into a good college. We justify ourselves by trying to get into a good job. We justify ourselves by trying to keep that good job. We justify ourselves by finding a good spouse. We justify ourselves by having good, well-behaved, educated children. That's how it works. And as convoluted as this sounds, this is where we find our approval and identity in this world. Then we justify ourselves afterward by trying to by the image that we portray to our colleagues and friends. We justify ourselves by the things that we possess and we're never content with what we have. We justify ourselves on what we have to retire on and we justify ourselves all the way to the grave. This is the cycle that we live in apart from Jesus. We constantly have this deep down need to want to prove ourselves to other people and to look better than we really are. And as a result, we are a restless nation, we are a restless people, and many of us claim to be followers of Jesus, and we are restless. And the world looks at this version of Christianity, a bunch of people who claim to love Jesus, but are restless and anxious and worried, and they say, no thanks. I don't want that. I don't want to be a part of that. Here's what happens with religious people, and this may be you this morning. They add religion to the mix, and it becomes deadly. Many people take that self-justifying attitude that they apply to the rest of their lives, and they now add it to their religion. And the result is that you do good things to show how good you are. You give to show how righteous you are. You pray loudly to show how pious you are. You shout and draw attention to yourself to show how spiritual you are. And you are exhausted and you wonder why, because you thought that you would find rest in God, but you were more tired and more exhausted than you were before you ever came to Jesus. Because you are now starting to earn your right to God. Self-justifying. Here's what happens. We can't put it down. It's the same thing that we do in the world. We just add Jesus to it. That's what these guys in Hebrews were doing. No wonder people walk away from Christianity. No wonder they walk away from their faith. Because it was never true Christianity. It was a self-justifying religion, just like any other religion. True Christianity, the gospel, the grace, Jesus brings rest. Why? Because he justifies you before you ever even lift a finger. He says you are justified, not because of what you did, but because of Jesus. He justifies you. He sanctifies you. He saves you. It is his work. And you don't have to prove it before him. True Christianity is about hearing Jesus and believing him when he says, it is finished. It's finished. You don't have to add to it. You don't have to do something to it. It's done. I saved you. I rescued you. True Christianity rests in that. And listen, that's hard to do. You say, no, it's not. Yes, it is. It's extremely hard to do for all of us because we want to show God we're good enough. We want to show God we're worthy enough. We want to show God, listen, God, you made a good choice in saving me. We want to prove to God that we are right. But only in the gospel can you find true rest where you can actually enjoy work and labor for Jesus in this world because you don't need to justify yourself. Because when you find Jesus, you can work and labor because you've already been justified and his opinion is the only thing that matters. That's the only thing that counts. Listen, that means what's separating many of you this morning from God is not your sins. But listen, it's your damnable good works. You're working so hard, but you're doing it without Jesus. And you're doing it for all the wrong motives. Of course, all of us in this room repent of our sins. We confess our sins. The Pharisees did that. They repented. But did they have rest? No. You need to repent of the reasons you're do, doing the things you do, even if it's the right things. Some of you are doing right things, but for the wrong reasons. You're doing it to earn something from God instead of out of your love for God. Amen. And you need to repent. You don't need to prove yourself to God. He has approved of you. He has accepted you. Now you can live in your identity in Jesus. 
See, when you live out trying to earn something from God, you get burned out. But when you live in your identity in Christ, knowing who you are because of Jesus, this life is rewarding. It's enjoyable. See, no wonder religious people look like they take shots of lemon juice every morning. They're grouchy, they're angry, they're upset. They sing in church and they shout. But the moment they walk out, all they can do is complain about everything that's wrong in the world and complain about everything that's wrong in church, complain about everything else. They're grouchy people. Some of you guys that are parents, um, when your kids were in diapers, you can relate, right? Your kid um, poo-poos. I said it in church. Poo-poos in church. I mean, in poo-poos in your diaper. Um, and they walk around, and they have this look on their face. They know that something's wrong, and it smells horrible, but they don't realize it's themselves, right? And they're walking around with a dirty diaper, and they've got this look on their face. And they're upset, and they're angry. That's what most Christians are like. They're, they, they stink, they smell because of their good works, and they don't realize it's themselves, but they're looking at everyone else, blaming everyone else for their problems. See, you've met people like this. People that will come in here and sing and shout and holler, but the moment you leave, they're just griping and complaining about how bad everything in the world is and how bad everything in life is, and they drive you nuts. They don't represent Jesus. They don't show the love of Jesus to people. See, that's why most people will look at Christianity and say, I don't want that, because they aren't restful people. They're doing all the right things, but they're doing it for the wrong reasons. See, like ancient Israel, we live in a wilderness, and we're wandering restless, trying to find our identity and value in the world, trying to find rest apart from God. People do this in the church, and people do this in the world, and some of us are good at mixing it together. But listen, neither one of them will work or bring rest to our souls. See, this makes the enemy of rest our our attempts to self-justify ourselves. That's why we're restless. Our attempts of self-justification in the eyes of other people, and listen, sometimes in our own eyes, we just got to prove that we are good enough, right? And we're working so hard to prove ourselves. See, this is important for the church in Hebrews to understand because they felt like they had anything but physical rest. But if that was what God was promising to them, they were wrong. No wonder many of them were ready to jump ship. That's why there's so many warning passages in the book of Hebrews. Are they losing their salvation? No, not at all. They just had a wrong version of Christianity. They were clinging on to religion, and the writer is telling them that God is opening rest for you. That what you're doing is not rest. Rest is not religion. Rest is gospel. Rest is grace. Rest is relationship with the Father. Rest is knowing that Jesus is for you, not against you. Rest is not doing things for God to earn God's approval. That's religion. You don't need to do religion. You are approved by God. That's rest. This is why it's so important. This is why it's so important for us this morning. So the enemy of rest is our ways to self-justify ourselves. But how do we get to real rest? What is the way to rest? Look at verse 1. He gives us two things. Therefore, while the promise of entering rest still stands, let us fear, lest any of you should seem to have failed to reach it. Now we understand why many of them fail to reach rest, because they're trying to earn it. But what are the ways to rest? There are two things that the writer mentions in our text, and they're interesting. The first thing he says is, in verse 1, is fear. Be afraid. That doesn't seem right, right? I mean, you want rest? Be afraid. Be very afraid. Um, You want to be restful? You got to be afraid? What does that mean? Earlier in chapter 2, he talks about that we're free from fear, but now he's telling us to be afraid. Do you realize there's a healthy fear in an unhealthy fear? There is a healthy fear of unbelief. Last week, we looked at how people were not able to enter the promised land because of their unbelief. And he's telling us that we should be afraid of unbelief so that you don't wander back off into trying to earn something from God. As Christians, we should be afraid that we don't wander back off into self-justification mode all the time and become restless, even in doing God's work. 
The writer is saying that our radar needs to be up and we should be ready to detect, detect any ounce of unbelief in our hearts. Any ounce. Fear can be a good thing, right? It can be a really good thing. There's a good fear about teaching our children to look both ways before they cross the street. You instill a healthy fear in them of being careful and the dangers of not looking both ways. You can die. You can get hurt. You can, bad things can happen. Be careful. Be watchful. Having a healthy fear causes you to check both ways before crossing the street. It doesn't cause you to shrink away from crossing, but causes you to be watchful as you do. It doesn't paralyze you or scar you for life. It causes you to say that you will never, it doesn't cause you to say that you'll never cross the street again. That's not what it's saying at all. It's a good, healthy fear. Watchful, be mindful, pay attention. See, that's what the author is getting at. There's a good, healthy fear that we should have. Not of being afraid of losing our salvation, but being afraid of unbelief creeping into our lives that pulls us away from Jesus. We don't have to live in constant fear. We don't have to live in constant bad feelings. But listen, the bad feelings, they only come when there are temptations to distrust God and his promises. You should fear that. And even then, those bad feelings that we have, what the Bible calls convictions of the Holy Spirit, shouldn't, they should drive you into the arms of Jesus instead of trying to earn your way back. They should drive you to him. We live by faith as believers. Fear only rises when faith shrinks. It only rises long enough to bring us back running to Jesus. It's okay. Fear is a good thing. What does that look like? Let me show you what the symptoms of unhealthy fear are. When you have unhealthy fear in your life, it's evident in your life because you worry, you're anxious, you panic, you're easily set off, you complain, you covet, you greed, you are restless. These are all steps away from the gospel. These are all steps away from Jesus. Listen, if these things are constantly evident in your life, you're a restless person and you need to repent. But there's a second part to this. There's a second part to what the writer says. There's one more thing you have to do besides just fearing God. And it's in verse 2. It's trusting God. For good news came to us just as to them. But the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. Here we have good news, gospel. It's coming to us, and it came to the folks in the wilderness as well. See, the problem with the wilderness generation, and it could be our problem as well, is that even though they believed, they never trusted God with their lives. When we believe but don't trust the gospel, we end up becoming very restless. What good news did the people in the wilderness get? What was the gospel to them? Here's the gospel. That an all-powerful God who loves you enough to rescue you from slavery. He's going to take you into a promised land. He's going to bring you to a place of rest. He's going to bring you to a place of prosperity and joy and peace. This was the good news that the people had received while they were in bondage. They believed enough to walk out of Egypt. But they didn't trust God enough that God would take them all the way through. See, that's the writer, what the writer is saying in the book of Hebrews. They believed enough to walk away from Judaism and religion and the world. But to really trust God with our lives? To really believe that God will take care of every detail of our lives? They weren't sure about that at all. This is that where a lot of people were in their faith. And that's why the writer is incredibly hard and difficult on them in this passage. You remember the story of the 12 spies? Moses sends 12 spies into the promised land. And he says, go spy the land and tell me the report. Ten of them come back and they are talking about how big the giants are in the land and how they'll never win. And they say they'd rather go back to Egypt and be in bondage than enter the promised land. And Joshua and Caleb and comes and they don't talk about how big the people are. They say, yeah, they're there. But listen, our God is so much bigger. Our God is so much greater. We can overcome them. The, 12, the 10 spies were restless because they thought they had to do it. Joshua and Caleb were restful because they knew they served a God that was more than able to do it. 
See, we too have seen great things. We have been given good news. We've seen the work of Jesus on the cross. We've seen his resurrection. Listen, it isn't simply enough to nod your head and say, yeah, that cross thing is great. It isn't simply good enough to nod your head and say, yeah, I believe in the resurrection. If you don't live and trust God with your lives, you're in danger. It's not enough to simply say yes to the facts of Christianity. That's not what God is calling us. Because the Bible says in James that even the demons believe that Jesus rose from the dead. They believe that. doesn't make a difference whether you believe Jesus rose from the dead. It doesn't make a difference in your life and how you live. Whether you trust God with your life, it means nothing. It's one thing to believe. It's a totally different thing to say, God, I trust you with my life. The people in the wilderness knew and saw the works of God, but they never trusted God with their own lives. They never trusted that God was able to take care of them. And so when they saw the world before them, anxiousness, worry, fear, doubt crept into their lives. How does the gospel produce rest in our lives? Let me give you three things, and my time's running out, so I won't finish the message this week, but let me give you three things of how the gospel produces rest in our life. Number one, when you actually rest, when you actually trust the gospel, it gives us rest from the guilt of our sins. Don't underestimate the power of guilt. It actually drives a lot of us in what we do. A lot of us carry a lot of false guilt around. Things that are not actually true or things we fail to believe in the gospel about our past. Even though we've been forgiven of our sins, we carry it around, we carry this guilt around, and we try to make up for it somehow. Some of you, what motivates you in your walk for Jesus is not your love for Jesus, but you're trying to earn something back for God for the things that you've done in your past. And that's a dangerous thing. Listen, There's a strict warning. There's a stern warning here in Scripture. If you are trying to earn something from God, you're basically slapping Jesus in the face because you're saying the power of the cross wasn't enough for your salvation. There's a danger there. Don't live in guilt. Don't let guilt motivate you. There's dangerous territory, and if that's you, you need to repent this morning. Secondly, it gives us rest knowing that God is for us and not against us. The wilderness generation didn't think that God was for them. In fact, they thought that God was, had some cl- cruel, ulterior motive in what he was doing. This is why they wanted to go back to Egypt. And you've met Christians like that that have this ungodly fear, afraid that God is going to strike them down for any bad decision. They won't take any risks for the sake of the gospel because they're afraid they'll make bad choices. They're afraid of doing anything because they're afraid of God's wrath and anger. They fail to realize that because of the cross, God is no longer their enemy, but God is for them and not against them. That's why Paul would write in Romans, if God is for us, who can be against us? Third allows us to place our burdens and our lives in the hands of a God who loves us. It allows us to place our burdens and our lives on a God who loves us. See, when we trust the gospel, not just simply believe the facts, but when we're able to trust the God of the gospel, we're able to put our burdens and our lives in the hands of a God who loves us. We open the door of our hearts, as we talked about a few weeks ago, allow God to come in, go into every room, and take out what doesn't belong there because we know what he's doing is for our good. It allows us to trust him. A couple nights ago, Tim, we let him watch Power Rangers, and he woke up at like midnight, scared, had a bad dream, and ran into our room and crawled into our bed and cuddled up right next to me and fell asleep and didn't wake up till the morning. He felt safe and secure because he was in his father's arm. Listen, the same is true for us. We are safe, we're secure because we are in the hands of a loving God. Listen, children can do 
a lot in this world if they know their parents are for them and if they're with them. The reason we as Christians get restless is because we carry the weight of the world on our shoulders and we're not willing to let it go. And out of a sense of pride, we refuse to lay it down to an all-loving, all-powerful, all-sovereign Jesus who offers to carry the weight of our burdens for us. We don't want to do that. We want to carry it ourselves. This is why Peter warns us to humble ourselves before the Almighty God. And he continues and he says, cast all of your burdens upon him because he cares for you. Some of you this morning need to be reminded of the old hymn, and I don't know if many of you know it. It was a song that we used to sing. It basically went, leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. If you trust and never doubt, he will surely bring you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Listen, guys, the Christian life, day by day, hour by hour, minute by minute, is trusting and believing in the promises of God to help us, to guide us, to take care of us, to provide for us, to forgive us, and to bring us home. That's our life. If we forsake that trust, we move to justifying ourselves, and we enter into restlessness. That's where we enter. Finally, the writer gives us five invitations to rest, and I don't have time to go into it, but let me give it to you real quick. He goes into four different passages in the Old Testament. In creation, he says, on the seventh day, God rested. Have you ever thought about that? Has God actually wiped out that he needed to rest? Was God actually worn out from all of this work that he needed to be wiped out? Was God um, sitting on his couch, pulled a seat up, and grabbed a drink because he was completely wiped out? No, not at all. What was he doing? Why was he resting? Because he was showing us that when we are in him, there is an invitation for us to rest in him, to trust him, to believe him with our lives, that we don't have to prove ourselves. When Adam sinned, we lost that rest. But because of Jesus, we're now welcomed back into that rest. Then he talks about the wilderness generation. The wilderness generation was restless in their lives. And just like in creation, even though the people rejected God's rest, God offered it to them, taking them all the way to the promised land. Then he talks about Joshua. Here's a really cool story. Joshua, do you remember? After they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, they get to the promised land, and where do they go first? To a city called Jericho, right? All of the previous generation is dead. Now it's just young guys in there, young 18, 19 year olds. They, the Bible says they have no weapons, they have no soldiers, they have no fighting men. Why? Because their parents have all died. These are basically young kids. So Joshua goes to God and says, God, what are we going to do? And God says, Do you have any musicians? Do you have any people that can sing? Do you have a marching band? All right, gather them together. Let's dress them up like Mumford and Sons as much as possible and put on a straw hat and suspenders and give them a banjo and let's get them to walk around the city, right? And that's what they do. They walk around like a marching band creating music. That's all they had. They didn't have any fighting men. They had no weapons. They put a marching band together and walk around and young people, all they like to do is yell and scream. So at the end of seven days, they just start yelling and screaming and the walls fall down. And they enter into the promised land. But did they find rest there? No, they didn't. Because if Israel was the promised land where we would find rest, all of us would have to go to Israel to find it. But it wasn't there. So then he goes to David's generation, and David talks about how God is still offering rest. And you got to think about David's generation. The land was in peace. Solomon, his son, everything was going well. They were the wealthiest nation. Everything was, they were the most powerful nation in the world. And David says, we still don't have rest. And God's calling us to rest. And finally, he offers the rest to us. He says, now there remains, in verse 9, a Sabbath for the rest of the people. And that's an invitation for us. He's saying the rest is still available. And he uses specifically the word Sabbath. Why? He takes it all the way back to creation, to when God created and said, the rest that was offered to you in creation is the same rest I'm still offering. 
I never shut it down, I never close the door, that rest is still available. And in verse 11, he gives us an application, let us strive to enter that rest. Why? Because there are days when we do it well, there are days when we do it bad. And he says, keep striving, keep striving, keep pursuing rest in Jesus. The invitation is coming to you from the mouth of Jesus himself. Let me close. You remember the story of Joshua? The word Joshua in the Greek is the word Yeshua. It's Jesus. Jesus was the true and better Joshua in ways that we can never imagine. Joshua was an incredible leader. He brought the people into the promised land, led them through the walls of Jericho, and they entered into the promised land. Listen, they didn't even have to fight to get into it. God brings the walls down, and they walk right into the promised land. It just fell. They walked right in with freedom. But that wasn't the real test, rest. That wasn't the real rest for them. That wasn't what God was offering them from the beginning of creation because they would later walk away from the land. 1,500 years later, God would send another Yeshua, Jesus. This leader would be born in Bethlehem. He would go to the cross and he would die. He would rise again and he would open the doors for his people to enter into a city where they didn't have to fight again. Just like the people walked into the promised land without fighting. The exact same way Jesus opens up the door. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to fight to get in. He has flung the door wide open. And without any effort or work on our part, we can enter in and enjoy the rest that God has offered us. This morning, are you restless? Are you trying to prove yourself and your identity to people around you? Are you not trusting Jesus with your life? The invitation is still open. The offer is still available, God says, today. Today, if you will enter that rest. We're a restless people. Why? Not because we have a lot on our plate. Could it be is because we don't trust Jesus with our lives? Father, this morning, would you convict us of any vain attempts that we have or we are doing to somehow prove ourselves to the world, somehow prove ourselves to you, somehow prove ourselves to even ourselves. Would you help us to find the rest that's only found in Jesus? Thank you. Thank you that Jesus opened the doors that we don't have to earn our way in. We don't have to say seven prayers or we don't have to do go to a city or we don't have to do anything. We just are called to trust you with our lives. Thank you. Thank you for identifying with us. Thank you for approving us because of Jesus. Thank you for calling us your sons, your daughters. Thank you for making Jesus our brother. Thank you for never leaving us or ever forsaking us. Thank you that you are for us and not against us. Thank you that our hope is built only in Jesus. We love you. It's in Jesus' name.